watch. Ahoy there! Ahoy there! And welcome aboard the good ship Watch. For the next few weeks, we'll be taking you on a journey, or rather, we'll be following a journey that was made over 200 years ago by this man. His name is Cook, Captain James Cook, and he's one of the most famous sailors who ever lived. Let's have a look and see where the voyage is going to take us. I've got a globe here, which is a map of the world. These red bits here are the land, and all the blue, that's this part here, is the sea. There's lots of it, isn't there? In fact, there's almost three times as much sea as there is land. People often say that there are seven great seas all together. Let's have a look at them. Right up the top is the Arctic Ocean. It's the North Atlantic. South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the North Pacific, South Pacific, and right down at the bottom is the Southern Ocean, the seven great seas of the world. And when we've finished these programs, we will have sailed all the seven seas with Captain Cook. The first voyage that Cook planned was to the South Pacific. Now, the South Pacific is quite a long way from Britain, and it was going to take many months of sailing to get there. And to do a journey like that, you'd need a very strong ship. And this is the one that Cook chose for the trip. She's called the Endeavour. The Endeavour. Not exactly a beauty, is she? <laughs> That's because she was originally built to carry coal. But to an explorer like Cook, looks didn't matter. All he was interested in was a good, strong ship that was the right one for the job. And the endeavour was just what he wanted. So now you've met the captain and you've met the ship. Now we're going to travel back in time 200 years. And I want you to imagine the scene on the quayside as Captain Cook made his final preparations for the voyage ahead. Getting ready to go on a long voyage takes a lot of hard work. In Cook's case, he had to get enough food on board to feed his crew for almost a year. And there were lots of mouths to feed. 92 people in all. Apart from the ordinary sailors and the officers, there were the ship's carpenters, a ship's blacksmith, to make the nails and do the metal work. And soldiers, in case there was any fighting. There was also a team of scientists. Their job was to collect rare plants and flowers and observe the birds and fishes. They were well equipped with all the latest scientific instruments. The ordinary crew were used to sailing, but for some of the scientists, it was the first time they had been on a long voyage. One of them had brought his greyhound along for company. Once they had loaded everything on, Captain Cook read the ship's rules to the crew. Ships have their own rules, just like schools do. It helps to make things run smoothly. And then it was time to go. As the officers gave the orders, the sailors climbed nimbly up the masts to let the sails down. The voyage of the Endeavour had begun.
Now, the endeavour wasn't that big, only 32 metres long, which is about roughly the size of some school halls. So how did they manage to fit everything in? Well, most of the provisions were kept down at the bottom of the boat. For instance, there was a compartment here where they stored all the drinking barrels. They took 1,200 gallons of beer and 1,600 gallons of rum. There was another compartment here where they stored all the food. 6,000 pieces of pork, 20 tons of bread and flour, and lots of other food, including almost half a ton of cheese. Mind you, not that the cheese was that marvellous. In fact, it was so hard that sometimes the sailors used to make spare buttons for their clothes out of it. <laughs> and here they had the powder room, where they kept all the gunpowder and bullets and cannonballs they would need in case they got into a fight. At the bows of the ship, that's at the front, they stored all the sails and the ropes. Very important for a sailing ship. Now, what about the crew? Where did they live? Well, Captain Cook himself had a cabin at the stern of the ship. That's the back of the ship. There's Cook's cabin. And his officers and scientists had smaller cabins also at the stern of the ship. There wasn't a great deal of room, but they were a lot better off than the rest of the ordinary crew. Now, they slept in hammocks in this middle section. It's not very big only about the size of one of your classrooms. So the sailors had to take it in turns to sleep in their hammocks, or about 30 sailors at a time. So that's all the crew and all the stores fitted into the ship. It's a bit of a squeeze, but they managed it. But now, how are they going to get the ship to carry them halfway round the globe? How does a sailing ship work? Well, to show you, we're going to go and have a sail in a boat of our very own. Ahoy there! Welcome aboard the good ship Ondina. And meet a friend of ours called Tony. Hello. Tony knows all about sailing and he's going to give us land lovers the orders. Now the thing about sailing ships is that they all work in much the same way. They have the same way of starting, of stopping and the same way of steering. If a sailor wants to keep a ship in the same place, he uses a thing called an anchor. Can we haul it up, Tony? Haul away! Here it comes. There we are. Now then, can you see the shape of it? It's pointed at either end. And when the anchor is at the bottom on the seabed, it drags along until it catches in the sand and it holds the ship firm. Well, the anchor's on board now, but if you look at the bow of the ship, you'll notice that we're still not moving. To do that, we need to raise a sail and have the wind blowing. In the old days, the sailors used to believe that you could whistle for a wind. They believed that if you whistled, you'd get up a nice breeze. Well, we've certainly got plenty of wind blowing today. Now, as I pull on the rope, the sail is hoisted up the mast. You watch what happens. The sail is beginning to bulge. Now, what do you think's doing that? It's the wind. As the wind fills the sail, it pushes the boat along. And as you can see, we're off. Once you're moving, you have to make sure that you're going in the right direction. And to do that, we have a steering wheel. At the back of the boat, there's a flap, and that's called a rudder. Now, if I want to turn right, I move the steering wheel to the right, and the steering wheel turns the rudder, and then the boat turns to the right. Or, in sailor's language, to the starboard. Now, if I want to turn to the left, I turn the steering wheel, which again turns the rudder to the left, and the boat to the left. Or, in sailor's terms, to the port. Have you noticed this flag? It's called the Red Ensign. A Union flag in the corner, and the rest of it plain red. All merchant ships and private vessels have to carry it, and in the old days, 
Royal Navy ships had to fly it as well. That was in Captain Cook's day. Sometimes they used to call it the Red Duster. It's nice, isn't it? Perhaps you could make one for the classroom or even make up a set of signalling flags. Signalling flags are used to send messages from ship to ship. This is the Blue Peter, and that means my ship is about to leave the harbour. This one means my ship has stopped. You can also send very short messages with flags. This one is yes. This one is no. This is my favourite message. In the old days, these two flags would have meant, my ship is infected. I have had cases of disease in the last 10 days and there is an unusually high death rate among the rats on board. It's a good one, isn't it? Now you might think a message like that would hardly ever be used, but you'd be wrong. Because in Captain Cook's day, sickness and disease were one of the biggest problems that a captain had to face. Cook knew that disease was more likely to break out in a dirty ship, so he made sure that the endeavour was as clean as possible. The sailors scrubbed the decks down every day. And they also had to keep their living quarters clean. Each of the sailors had to wash twice a week, using buckets of sea water. And even the animals got a scrub down. As well as keeping his ship clean, Cook made sure that his crew were properly fed. Animals like the goat gave them fresh milk. And eggs were provided by the chickens and the ducks. Fresh fruit and vegetables were more of a problem as there were no refrigerators in those days. Instead of vegetables, Cook gave his crew a sort of cabbage called sauerkraut, which was pickled in vinegar to stop it going bad. The crew were not too keen on it at first. In fact, they refused to eat it. But then Cook had a good idea. He gave it to his officers for dinner, and that made all the difference. When the crew heard that Cook and the officers were having sauerkraut, they decided that maybe it wasn't so bad after all. Perhaps you're wondering how we know so much about Captain Cook and the Endeavour. Well, the reason is that many of the people on board kept a sort of diary of the voyage, including Cook himself. That's something that you could do. Start your own Captain Cook logbook. Fill it up with all the things that you've seen in the program. And as it's a ship's logbook, make sure that you write as carefully and as accurately as you can. Perhaps you could paint something on the cover, like a ship, for instance. Or you could make it round, like a map of the world. Remember to leave lots of space for all the things that we'll be seeing in the next few weeks. Perhaps you'd also like to learn our Captain Cook sea shanty. That's the song we're going to end the program with now. Here's how it goes. Captain Cook the sailor spoke out one summer day. Let's all aboard the ship that's moored in yonder Plymouth Bay. Let's all aboard Endeavour and whistle for a breeze. I'll sail with you, my trusty crew. I'll sail the seven seas. Anchors away, anchors away, away, away. We'll sail the seven seas. Bye-bye. Goodbye. See you next week. Let's sing it again, shall we? All right, why not? Okay.
Captain Cook, the sailor, spoke out one summer day. Let's all aboard the ship that's moored in yonder Plymouth Bay. Let's all aboard Endeavour and whistle for a breeze. I'll sail with you, my trusty crew. I'll sail the seven seas. Anchors away, anchors away, away, away. We'll sail the seven seas. Anchors away. Anchors away, 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 we'll sail the seven seas. Well, the next programme this afternoon, 20th Century History, follows in a minute.